Um, hey everyone, I'm sorry I started a little late as running around and uh, now here I am. Um, I am really thrilled to get to read a little bit from uh, Love and Industry, which is the new book that uh, I think people were telling me has been shipping uh, today and yesterday. So um, uh, I'm just going to read an essay really quickly. And um, I think I'm actually going to read one of my favorites, uh, uh, which is Flying the Flannel. Um, I should wear a flannel for this, right? One. All right. This is my very special sparkly flannel. Here we go. Um, all right. And uh, Flying the Flannel first appeared in Vila. I bought my first blue plaid flannel at Kmart, so it must have been 1987 or 88, when I was a junior in high school in small town, Illinois. Flannel is any fabric softened by brushing its fibers out into a fuzz called a nap. And the first plaid flannel patterns were woven in 16th century whales from the bluish white, brown, and black wool of a muted rainbow pattern of sheep. My cheap flannel was cotton with the plaid pattern printed on, and therefore it was a copy of a copy of a copy, as removed from the original as Xeroxed image of a photograph. I sort of knew my high school flannel was fake because I'd seen other plaid shirts sold in upscale outdoorsy stores that were made from real thread in different colors woven together. I liked the thinness of mine. I like I like other fake things I was born like I like other fake things I was born into. Things I shouldn't like but do. Things that remind me of the Midwest. Hamburger helper mac and cheese from a box, fries from the freezer, food extruded, mass produced, and wrapped in plastic. I don't think flannel would mind that its essence has been copied. Flannel forgives. In the 1980s Midwest, flannel typically meant metal dudes, but the metal dudes had earned their flannel from their blue collar fathers. A flannel at that school instead of a button down meant I want to be comfortable and this is my dad's and yes it's worn and dirty and that's me so fuck you. We all stole clothes from our dads and brothers. That was just how we dressed. Or more precisely it was how they, our fathers and brothers, dressed because it made sense for work. And then we copied them. I was using this fabric that was so soft to cross over into something either into boy land or into a land that was rough, the land of working with one's hands, the land that was invisible and faded as the rust belt withering around us. The first time I wore my flannel to school, I was hiding the tiniest of rebellions. It covered a t-shirt upon which I'd hand lettered with fabric paint and a toothpick, a message about the perils of nuclear war. I copied the quote from a library book, Jonathan Shell's The Fate of the Earth. We look away. We remain calm. We are silent. We hope that the Holocaust won't happen. Kids in my high school did not wear t-shirts with slogans meant to save the world. My farm town high school of 2,800 students was known primarily for its football team and its strict discipline which might have made it the perfect Red Dawn epitome of the Reagan years. A Che Guevara shirt, if anyone had known the image or what it meant, would have earned a suspension or a busted lip. So I covered my DIY shell quote with a flannel for extra safety. Flannel was an envelope, and my sternum was a shy billboard I could flash and hide. Flannel bulk bulked me up, hid my body, yet let me choose when and what to reveal. I remember hunching my shoulders as I walked near the school office, pulling the flannel around me. I got into trouble in those days like everyone did. 
I was once threatened with suspension for asking why we didn't have a school newspaper, but I was also an anxious honor student, a good girl. I walked toward the science hall in the auto shop where the stoners and the shop guys hung out, also decked in flannel. We were deep in the corn grid of the Midwest, where it ran up against the grid of South Chicago land. If there was a map to our future options, it might well have been as squared and segmented as the intersecting lines across our backs. We were to head straight, turn only at right angles, and not expect too much in the way of variation. Years later, a boyfriend would tell me I should show my body more, that I hid in baggy jeans and big shirts, but that boxiness was freedom. My flannel came from the men's section of Kmart, helping me to return to my tomboy roots after a few years of spending my money on bizarre 1980s Coca-Cola logo apparel, Ocean Pacific t-shirts, and over-zippered jackets and shirts. Flannel appeared as a passageway out. A few boys and girls had started wearing the neat new wave fashions of pressed shirts with the top button closed at the throat with this style, boys and girls looked the same, with blotches of lipstick and eyeliner on whitened faces. I loved the cure, but my body wanted more of a mess. The electronica of Erasure and the Pet Shop Boys and their neatly composed outfits lived in a clean space. And next door was where we flannel-clad kids lived inside a punk roar that arrived to collide with the ocean of blues to rock to metal riffs we'd been raised in. And the tent that sheltered this area where it's the two waves met, at least in my tiny corner of the Midwest, was flannel. In the music, we saw ourselves as something and flannel came to stand for whatever that something was. It let us see ourselves. I must have seen flannel stretched across the shoulders of rock stars whose cassettes I bought, Yola Tango and the Pixies and their replacements. I leaned in to listen and watch their images on television, hoping to decode in the videos of MTV's 120 Minutes any signal that might lead me to a future beyond the girl writhing on the hood of a car in a white snake song. Flannel hid a woman's shape Yet it also revealed as we pushed our breasts against its grid. Inside Flannel's tent, I could pause. I became a cipher, a vertical invocation of not dressing to please those around me. I had safety because I was one of a herd, and yet I was opting out. Days in Flannel were the days in which my body would not be sized up, nor my energy drained by inventing appeasing responses to flirting and banter. I was dressed for my own comfort, and in a roomy flannel, I could actually breathe. My chest could expand, I could slouch, and my body itself could enjoy the feeling of being alive without having each breath be a performance for others. Those breaths in flannel did not save me, but they accompanied me into adulthood with the whisper that such a space was possible, a space where I could be only for myself. Flannel entwines with another vanished smell, the particular intense plastic odor of unwrapping the shrimp, shrink wrap from a new cassette. The slight give as you fold open the case, the cassette itself so new it almost seems moist, just born. You pop it into the cassette player on the dashboard and it speaks, it sings, while you slip out the liner notes, fold it over and over like a note passed in school to read the lyrics, the acknowledgments, the secret messages meant only for you in the shelter of your dirty car. I purchased my first Sex Pistols cassette at a Sam Goody's in a Joliet mall when I was in eighth grade. A few weeks late earlier, a semi-scary boy in my class held his headphones up to my ears and let me hear the melodic screaming. I listened to it and I immediately loved it, which made no sense because I'd also been a devoted fan of Huey Lewis and the News. But the screaming and tonal almost chanting about anarchy opened a flower in my chest I had not known was closed. 
It wasn't that I wanted to be the boy who played me the tape. I wanted to be fierce. I wanted the map for that. I loved the angry sound which cut through the sleepiness of precious moments figurines and cheerleader tryouts and student council and eyeshadow and loves baby soft. So I became a mathlete who loved the dead Kennedys. A few years ago, while in the car running errands, my husband Cliff flipped through the dial and landed on a right-wing hate spew radio station. He listened to them to hear their arguments and obsessions, to keep tabs. But I often found myself yelling at them as if they could hear me, like a dog barking at a UPS truck. On that day, the host, Andrew Wilco, made a comment that he was fond of punk music. I sat up straight and pounded the dashboard with my fist and yelled at the radio, you can't talk about punk rock. My flannel, my head flamed with rage as if our, my nation had been invaded. I could almost feel the tiny particles of spit winging their way toward the radio and the windshield as I shook my head like a dog flapping its jowls. My husband looked over with his eyebrows up. I sat back, wide-eyed. We both laughed nervously, regarding me as if I had grown another head out of my forehead, the punk rock nationalist. Who can talk about punk rock? I explained to my husband that punk has never been right wing, but of course I was wrong. I only have to remember scowling at the skinheads with the red shoelaces pogoing at shows in Minneapolis. Yet I know I'm also right. I myself have sneered at the grid encasing punk culture. If it even exists anymore, the conformity and nonconformity, whatever. Screw punk if it, if, it, if it would ever tell me I wasn't punk rock. I will fight anyone for the right to be part of a nation that never wanted to be a nation. Flannel is now written into music history wrong. It waves as a sort of flag, flag for the broad swath of music known as grunge. Grunge was not a name we chose, though. There was punk, and there was alternative, and there was metal. Bands like Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and Nirvana were Seattle, but also kind of metal. Soundgarden, or punk, Nirvana. They all fit loosely under the term alternative, which I would argue encompassed any band that appeared late at night on MTV's 120 Minutes. I could be wrong about the boundaries of punk and grunge, but I know the timeline. I started wearing the flannel I bought from Kmart around 1987. The music that would later be identified as grunge ruled from 1983 to 93, according to Michael Lat Levine, who co-wrote the 2009 book Grunge with Thurston Moore. Wikipedia says of flannel shirts, popular grunge bands like Nirvana and Pearl Bam used them as one of their trademarks of their shaggy look. If I weren't such a slacker, I might sign in as an editor to correct three editors in that sentence, three errors in that sentence. Those bands didn't think of themselves as grunge. They didn't use shirts in any way. Levine writes that the flannel wasn't packaging. That was just how they dressed. The shirts were not trademarks, which would indicate the desire to develop a brand and sell a product with an image. One of the things that stands out is the fact that Kurt is wearing a flannel shirt. Soon flannel would become a generic identifier for all the kids who were embracing slacker culture. But that wasn't true when Smells Like Teen Spirit was made. The math is backwards, at least for that girl standing in the front entryway of a high school in New Lenox, Illinois. Nirvana's video came out in 91. At that time, I had been wearing flannel studiously for four years, as had many kids around me. The wrongness of the timeline undermines that tender time in my life when I was trying to map out where I fit in a place that is often invisible and among, and among a group of people who are often thought to mean not much at all. In Grunge, Levine and Moore write that the era embraced slacker culture but few cultural retrospectives mention the backdrop of the bombs raining on Iraq during Operation Desert Shield. 
which lasted from August 2nd, 1990 to January 17th, 91. Analysis of slacker or Generation X culture rarely captures the protests against the first Gulf War or raises the question of whether young people felt hopeless after the Reagan years in the face of shock and awe war as televised spectacle. In other words, what slackers wanted to drop out of. The United States continued its legacy of geographic protectorates in order to ensure its supply of oil from the Middle East. In the early 1990s, we shipped our young people to Iraq with their Pearl Jam and Nirvana cassettes. Who knows if any of them brought flannels with them? Those of us back home who weren't fighting watched from our living rooms as Dan Rather broadcast with a backdrop of stunning traces of light from the dropping bombs. We pulled our flannels tight around our shoulders that winter, not knowing that the word flannel could also be a verb, meaning to talk evasively to, flatter in order to mislead. We came into flannel in a time of war as the Cold War bled seamlessly into endless intrusions in the Middle East. We stood on street corners with our wilting signs for peace in the driving snow. Before the internet, we watched the evening news for coverage of our carefully planned demonstrations and huge marches, and we saw nothing. We learned how to write press releases that we faxed off into the void. We were called slackers because we dressed down and wanted to opt out but we only slacked in depression and exhaustion after screaming to be heard. My generation cried into our flannel shirts, understanding that childhood had been over for a long while. The nice thing about a flannel is that for a time, it was all you needed. Nightgown, shirt, jacket, handkerchief, napkin, robe, sweater. Flannel was my animal skin. When I left home for college, flannel's muted colors allowed me to blend into various new flocks. First, I joined the neo-hippie geology majors and environmental activists whose flannels were often of the thicker woven kind, meaning a person came from a different home, a different place, a different bank account, and a different view of the world. Then I used the same flannel to pass into the punk rock and alternative crowds at music shows in Minneapolis, whose members wore authentically cheap copies and would never have been caught dead in a woven flannel. Finally came the anarchists, whose women wore tank tops with no bras and of course, a flannel over the top. The second and third groups did something audacious. They used your, their sleeves as the end of a knot, securing the flannel around their middles. The blue jeans of my 20s were practically falling off my ass more holes than denim fabric, but my superpowers, what little I had, were contained in the girdle of a flannel, its sleeves knotted around my waist, its bulk hanging behind me like a cape. Knotting the sleeves in front of my pelvis felt as natural as tying my shoes. The extra layer of fabric around my hips felt like protection. And the girl I was at 20 could tie a flannel around her waist and rock, E.T. Renborn writes in, a, in, a, in the history of the flannel binder and the cholera belt that, quote, girding the loins was also preparation for activity and for war. Warriors would wrap themselves in waist sashes that exist today in the form of the cummerbund, that strange tuxedo accessory that comes from the Persian cummerbund, which means loincloth. The girdle or belt divided the pure upper half from the impure lower half of the body, according to Renborn. I don't think I felt my nether regions to be impure, but accentuating the hips draws attention to curves and thus to sex. A flannel tied at hip level serves as a kind to inadvertently maximize curves, accentuating one's hips in contrast to the waist like a low budget bustle. Renborn describes the sacredness of belts and binders in protecting the body's vulnerable middle. It may be that in the subconscious mind, the flannel belt has become symbolic of duty, of a tight rein over the basic instincts of protection from a hostile environment, 
end quote. Fly in the Flannel is a, so is a song and an album by the band Firehose. I flailed and headbanged to it and other songs at their show in Minneapolis, maybe in 1992. And as soon as the club got steamy with sweat, I took my flannel sleeves and over-undered them into a knot at my pelvis. Maybe Dinosaur Jr. was headlining, and maybe I pulled a muscle in my neck from headbanging and pogoing. Afterward, we stepped into the cold, frozen and heated and steaming and laughing, shining under the street lamps. Sweating and headbanging at First Ave in Minneapolis, you could soak through a tank top or a t-shirt and the flannel around your waist would even get soaked with the sweat that poured from your body in a whirling mosh pit flung with glistening limbs. There was the joy of collision with no obligation. You could be physical, ecstatic, and it wouldn't matter for a second that you were a girl. We danced with our elbows out to jab-muscled assholes who got too violent. We laughed admirably at stories about girls who brought hat pins to the pit to poke at jerks who thought dancing was fight club. Now, flannel is quaint, old enough to be a set piece, like wearing a monocle. A piece on McSweeney's internet tendency entitled List Positions of the Kama Sutra for Midwesterners makes fun of people from the region for, quote, for wearing flannel, quote, unironically. After I read that, I took a good five minutes to flip through all of my days in flannel, trying to imagine them as an ironic performance. I became convinced first that the writer of the piece didn't understand what irony actually means. I wrote a long screed about irony and then I erased it. That bit of McSweeney's satire assumes we can choose either ignorance and natural behavior or conscious irony. I write in it the idea that a certain segment of the country shoulders a garment without knowing that the garment speaks, that the garment is a sign. I believe instead that in my high school days, even those who wore it for warmth and functionality knew it was a kind of flag. We chose it as a secondary nation, but not for the sake of irony. We chose it out of love. Copying is not always irony. Copying can be tribute. Copying is pastiche, making something new from what you have. Copying is reaching and creation. If my flannel shirt could have sung a song, that song would have been gridded like the fretboard of a guitar, a song crisscrossed with strains of social class and region, and the grit of country or city mixed with its opposite. Kids trying to create art and doing things that maybe their working and lower middle class parents would freak out about. Yet those kids, if I am right, might have said that flannel did not mean making fun of where they came from. Instead, flannel was used to make something new without jettisoning the markers of class and work. If there was any irony at all in a flannel as it was worn by these bands, by my friends and by me, I believe the shirt and its lumberjack reputation turned into a question when it was worn by Fugazi, who sang songs urging people to wake up and also to stop treating girls like shit, or by the dead milkmen with their plane of mayhem or even by Kurt Cobain with his dresser, dresses. The question was whether there could ever be a different kind of man than the men our boys were being raised to become. These days, my flannels rest like old dogs in a bin in my closet. I don't wear them much. Sliding my arm through a flannel sleeve is tiring, like riding time backwards. The shirts have become exhausting friends who show up from the past and demand that we raise hell, live on the edge. I shake out my favorite one on an overcast day when I have forgotten who I am. It comforts but also urges me to be the woman I dreamed I would become. The flannel wants me to live the collective, to be punk rock. It wants me to reveal and to hide to choose when to be seen. It holds up a cutout of the shape of a girl, all I dreamed I would be and all I was at 20. 
When I slip it on, I feel the cape too, and the loins girded for battle. A reminder of fully inflated lungs, elation and anarchistic joy. I am that girl then, the one who might not have imagined how the grid and the shape of the future would adhere to her body. Um, thanks to folks who are here. Um, I will make sure to post this on YouTube with captions afterward. Um, and check out Lo Love and Industry if you liked it. Uh, and uh, please be well. Thank you.